suddenly got your first leadership gig, loving the new role, but feeling the pressure of your new responsibilities and all that expectation to perform? Well, don't worry, you're not alone. Crossing the chasm from a technical role to leadership, from doing stuff to managing and leading people is the toughest challenge any leader must make. Welcome to the Human Edge Show, the podcast dedicated to help you do just that, successfully cross the doing to leading chasm. Campbell Such here, Chief Chasm Crossing Guide. I've made all the mistakes so you don't have to. I want to help you learn those lessons much more easily by sharing my experiences and talking with brilliant people who have already figured it out. You'll get great actionable tips, strategies and techniques to make the transition so much easier and faster for you. Now let's get to it. Welcome to another episode of the Human Edge Show. I'm really privileged to have Matt Clayton on board with an interview today. Welcome, Matt. Fantastic to have you on the show. Thanks, Campbell. Matt is Managing Director of Meaningful. Matt's an award-winning creative director, strategist, technologist, and entrepreneur. He's passionate about solving complex problems in elegant, sustainable, and scalable ways, usually with a mixture of technology, design, and commerce. He's built, led, managed, or contributed significantly to multiple companies working as an entrepreneur for over 10 years now. He's also directed, contributed to, and or delivered hundreds of projects and solutions throughout his career. That's amazing, Matt. Look, that's great to have you on board. I'll kick off just by asking you, what's one thing that not many people would know about you? Well, my name is Matthew Clayton, but my full name is Matthew Mehdi Jamshid Khani Clayton. I'm half Persian, um, which most people don't know, but uh, my vote is certainly that Iranian or Persian food is the best cuisine on the planet. And, uh, uh, you know, that's... I think the most certain thing in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Iranian food is the best food ever. Yeah. And so where, where, where in Auckland would you go to find something that would match the best stuff you had back home or could, can you so find something around in Auckland? The problem with Iranian food, Campbell, is the best Iranian chefs are usually older women and men who only cook in their family home. And the food doesn't really translate that well to restaurants. Um, it's sort of an all-day cooking affair. So um, the best Iranian cook that I know of in New Zealand is um, my auntie down in Wellington, <laughs> and she doesn't have a restaurant, but, <laughs> but you know she'd happily feed both of us if we went down there. That's for sure. Oh wow! And so you always make sure that when you're heading to Wellington, you give her a bell and just say, "I'm, I'm popping in for a I meal." I've been there in a long time, but I do miss um, Iranian food for yeah. sure. That's, that's one thing. I, I wish there were restaurants around that did it. LA and you know places like that have quite a big Iranian food scene because there's so many Iranians there, um, food scene, sorry. But um, yeah, not in Auckland, unfortunately. There is an Iranian restaurant called Rumi in Parnell, um, um, which is pretty good. They're nice people, but not, it's, not quite, it's not quite at the, at the level. Shout out to Rumi, though. Most, everyone who's not Persian would enjoy Rumi food. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can see I've got somewhere I've got to go and eat that I haven't eaten before. Uh, Matt, just to, to kick off, um, I don't know if we can kind of take you back um, a few years now to, to when you f first made your early steps into leadership and, and management. Um, can you remember back then around um, some of the things that perhaps with the benefit of hindsight you might do differently and, and how you felt at the time and, and then and what led you into there, into a leadership role? Um, well, probably the first thing is... Um when I started my first company called Neighborhood, and um, I'm not a developer or an engineer, uh, I'm more of the business guy. So I needed a developer and engineer. So um, as a lot of people do when they're trying to find their sort of counterpart co-founder type of person, um, you know, I was introduced through, um, through family actually to um, someone who they knew who was a, you know, a great web developer and um, very naively, uh, I, I engaged with that person. It seemed like they were, you know, really great and knew what they were doing. And, um, you know, at the start, it sort of worked quite well. But then um, I made a lot of mistakes in terms of equity structure and things like that um, with this person and with this business. Um, so we were 50-50 off the bat, which is not a good place to be because if you have a disagreement, there's really no way you can 
um, make progress because you both have equal amount of voting rights in the company. So 50-50 is not a good place to start. And it's certainly not a wise idea to give someone who you've just met 50% of your company. <laughs> and uh, so I think the first thing about being a leader, which is really difficult, is that you end up having to hire. Um, and hiring is probably one of the single biggest things you need to be good at as a leader. And it's extremely difficult to become good at learning, particularly when you're hiring people um, within a domain and with skill sets that you have no real knowledge of. So um, even today, most people, um, including myself, it's very, very difficult as a non-developer to hire developers for their development capability, for example, because you simply don't know. You can't look at their work and go, this is great code because you, you can't read their code, right? So yeah. um, that's a very, very difficult thing to get your head around. And so probably my first experience of leadership was you know hiring the wrong person for the wrong reasons but in hindsight that's probably one of the best things i could have done is you know even just from that one experience i learned an immense amount not only about you know structuring companies and equity and things like that but also you know hiring the wrong people and particularly with technology it's such a hard domain to get your head around as a non um developer or non-engineer that um, you have to be very, very diligent about making sure that you know who you're, you know, getting into bed with per se or hiring. Um, and yeah, that's a that's a, a very difficult thing to to um, start doing as a leader. Yeah, it's um, like you know, in, in all my years of leadership and management, it's been one of the areas that I've found it's the most challenging as well. And I think it's something that you can never guarantee you're going to get it right. You can make a re have a really good hiring process and get unlucky with someone that just doesn't turn out the way they looked in the interviewing process or whatever process you go through. And equally, you might end up um, with a missing out on someone who could have been ideal if your process had been better. Have you developed any, you know, given the importance of that, not just in a, you know, in, a, in your situation, which is in, a, in an entre entrepreneurial business where you're trying to grow and, and develop with very limited resources, but in a, any leadership role, you know, one of the most important things is to get the team around you and, you know, within the organisation being as powerful uh, as, they, as, you, as you can, the right people. Have you found some things that would make it more likely that you'd get it right more often? that you could share with us? The first and foremost is I think that you need to be radically honest. Um, you need to be extremely clear about what you're looking for and what you need and vice versa. Um, great relationships are built off good communication. Hiring people is no different. Um, there's something to be said for um, understanding that your own intuition there's this sort of weird dichotomy between you really need to follow your own intuition, but you also need to be very diligent about observing what your intuition is telling you and trying to critique it yourself. Yep. So I think it's easy to fall into the trap of like, you like this person, you should hire them because you like someone is not a good reason to hire anyone. It's a, it's a piece of data. It's a, you know, anecdotal evidence. That's part of a greater whole. Um, I think you just have to be very diligent in making sure that people are who they say they are, um, you know, thoroughly vetting references, um, interviewing many people. Uh, I think it's very easy to kind of get enamored by one or two people, perhaps at the start of an interview process and then say, oh, let's not bother interviewing other people. But um, I think you just have to be thorough and disciplined. And so making sure that if there is a long list of candidates, you try to get through as many of them as possible, that you do have a good process and that you stick to it, that you understand what your principles of hiring are. I'm much more interested in um, people who are, um, you know, I really believe you have to be self-motivated. I, I think if you're going to a company looking to be motivated, that you're probably not going to find it. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in you really, people have to be self-driven and their work has to fit into their broader, um, you know, context and approach and goals for life. Um, and if it doesn't, if they're just turning up to get a paycheck, you know, sometimes we just need to turn up to work to get a paycheck. But particularly as an entrepreneur, you can't afford to hire people like that. You have to hire people who are motivated to be there and want to be part of the journey and who have something significant that they can contribute. So 
just like anything, uh, have a plan and stick to it and make sure your plan is robust um, and make sure you keep yourself in check because, again, it's very easy to um, be too informed by one good conversation or one good coffee and not do your due diligence in terms of really checking out this person's references and things like that. Not to say that, um, and I don't mean to say that in a you shouldn't trust what people say way. I say that in a you should make sure that you know what you're getting way. You know, it's just being thorough and being disciplined and taking emotion out of it. Um, it's probably another good point is try to hire with the least amount of emotion possible. Um, really look at what, what actually do you need out of the role and what actually do you need contributed and, and objectively does this person have it or is there evidence that they will be able to develop that capability? If they don't have it now, realistically, do you have the ability to invest in them in terms of upskilling them and those types of things? That's a big part of it as well. I see this a lot of time um, when you're hiring developers, it's very attractive to hire the sort of upcoming junior and intermediate types of developers because they're talented. But the reality is, is they need coaching and they need management. And so if you're not prepared to do that and you want to, you know, throw them in the mix of this, you know, really complex problem or business, but not give them adequate support, you're doing them a disservice. So that's coming, circling right back to my first point. It's about, I think the start point is just radical honesty. What do you actually need and why? What's going to work? What fits? What doesn't? And allowing that, you know, person to communicate really open honestly with you about whether or not it's the right thing. I, I tend to try and in my interview process, particularly the first one, I just want to really get to know the person and understand them. And that's obviously a very difficult thing to do. It takes a lot of time. So um, probably one last thing, Campbell, is, you know, don't rush it. You don't need to rush it, particularly when people are putting arbitrary deadlines on you. Recruiters are very good at going, oh, this person's got 10 different offers and we need to make a move now and blah, blah, blah. And no, don't, don't buy into any of that, you know, move productively and pragmatically and at a, at a pace that suits you, but don't rush the process just because someone else is telling you you have to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my experience is, is the same. Um, you, you want to move as quickly as you can, but without rushing and, and equally, the, you know, that, that pressure, because the worst thing you can do is hire the wrong person into the role. They may be fantastic in another role, but if they're not right for you, if they're not right for your organisation, if they're not, you know, the cultural fit isn't there. Um, and they're not motivated, I guess that's one of the, the biggies. So a couple of questions for me out of that. Um, one is, how do, you conf how do you get a good feel for whether someone's motivated? And that piece about, so I'm asking you two questions, I know we can come back to it if I, if I you know, if we lose sight of that one. And then the other one is you talked about the dichotomy of your intuition and, uh, you know, that feeling, you know, having you, trusting your intuition to help you uh, can be a really powerful thing, but recognising when it might not be or being able to, validate that your intuition's right. What do you do to help give you give you some confidence that, that your that you know what you're deciding maybe based on your intuition is actually valid and and it's not just a I like this person and I'm missing out a whole lot of things that uh, you know that might make it not a good hire. Um I'll address the second point because the first one has already escaped my mind, but we'll come back to that. But <laughs> it may have escaped mine too. <laughs> <laughs> Don't got to be. Um, I heard, I think it was um, on a podcast with Eric Weinstein, and he talked about this idea of um, being basically pathologically confident, but um, radically humble. And that's kind of what I mean. You have to be able to do both. You have to be really confident in your intuition, but you also have to be very, very, very humble. Um, and that's an incredibly delicate balance to find. And um, I think that both are possible if the humility comes first. I think the humility piece has to come first and um, humility or modesty or whatever you want to call it. And um, I guess the other part that I'm saying is that you have to find principles that work for you or values or whatever you want to call them. I'm very big on um, principles and putting them into practice. I think that's the, you know, everything changes and everything is very uncertain. But as we go through the world, we find things that resonate with us that we want to practice, that we want to manifest, that align with our character and who we want to be in our lives and our companies and things like that. And those things are, I think, values and principles. Now, we do this commercially as well. 
we establish what our brand values are. Um, you know, a good use of brand values is we say, okay, well, we want customers who are aligned with our brand values. We want partners who are aligned with our brand values. We want, you know, employees who are aligned with our brand values. Um, and I think that's the same thing as for you as someone who is working for a company, your values should really be aligned with that company. And if your values aren't, it's probably not the right company for you to work for and vice versa. Yeah. And um, those principles, I think, are quite difficult for people to develop, maybe because they, you know, developing the sort of principles you, you live your life by sounds like this big thing, but I actually don't think it's that complex. I think probably a good place to start is, um, you know, personal integrity is probably a big one. Say honesty is is a very big one. Honesty is very important, um, and uh, principles will principles will enable you to be able to navigate your way through things and give you a structure by which you can make decisions. And that's the most difficult thing is being able to navigate your way through things and make productive decisions. You never you're never going to get it right all the time. Um, and that's cool, but as long as you're doing it in a way that's systematic, um, I think you have a higher probability of success. Yep. So um, for me, those principles at the moment are, are quite simple. It's honesty, open-mindedness is a very, very big one. It's very easy to become closed-minded um, and you, you simply cannot afford to. Um, you know, the there's a lot of information in the world and there's also a lot of misinformation. Um, I don't think anyone is really an expert in anything. Um, and so again, coming back to the dichotomies, you have to really trust yourself. You have to trust yourself that if you're putting the work in and you're being diligent, you're being disciplined, you're sticking to your principles, you're treating people as you would like to be treated. I think that's all you can really do. You know, if, if you're really trying to add value and you're really trying to, serve people as a leader or in your business or whatever it is that you're doing, if you're really giving it a good go, that's all you can do. All you can do is give it a good crack. And, um, you know, coming back to that dichotomy and principles is, you know, it's, it's very important for me to have a great deal of humility, which is something that I certainly have not had um, throughout my whole life. It's something I've had to develop and hard fought to get that. Um, I've, I've definitely had pathological confidence, too much so, <laughs> you know, um, and, uh, you know, more and more recently is as I get older, my, my sort of principles and values become more and more clear to me, um, which is, um, you know, something that just happens over time. But, um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting. There's a saying that, that goes something like, um, um, uh, strong opinions lightly held so you, you know and and that's a, that's a challenge because the, the one of the, the hardest things is when we've got when we've got an opinion that's our view of the world and it's really easy to to disregard you know information that doesn't match with that you know it's the, the classical uh, confirmation bias issue um and only look for stuff that does that does suit it. And so you, your focus on humility, I think, is a really powerful one. Can I just try and define humility? And make, perhaps we can just touch on that just to help anyone that's listening to this understand what that is. So, so I think for me, being humble and being and the humility is really recognizing that you don't know everything, and that even though you may believe you do, that you're always open to hearing. Uh, something else that may be counter to that or that may be, a, you know, another view or some more information that you may be able to use to make a better decision or, or uh, look at things in a different way. How would you, how would you define uh, humility and, and humbleness? Well, I think, I think the dictionary definition is having a low to moderate opinion of oneself. Um, Modesty as a term or as a principle, I, I like as well, which I just looked at the definition of now, the quality or state of being unassuming in the estimation of one's abilities. So as you said, a simple way to put it is you, you don't know everything. Not only do you not know everything, you can't know everything. And thirdly, nor do you need to. <laughs> and that's a really important thing. Uh, that was something that took me a while to get my head around is, you know, I actually don't need to know everything either. Um, I think as an entrepreneur, it's very easy to become guilty of feeling like you need an answer to everything because usually when you're out there in the world, 
people are asking you questions about a whole bunch of stuff, some of it related to your business, some not, and you kind of feel like it's expected of you to have an answer. And, um, you know, a lot of how I started in my career was just finding answers to things which I didn't have the answers to. And so that was very useful. But, um, you know, as I've gotten older, I certainly understand that, you know, uh, uh, not only do I not need to know everything, I can't know everything. And um, it would be a fool's errand to try. Um, but in saying that, I also need to be careful of what I think I know. Because what I think I know is always changing as well. And um, that's the bit where the open-mindedness is very important. I think open-mindedness is quite easy to sort of a new concepts, but it's when the concepts that you are already familiar with or have an opinion on or have experience with or that are set in your life, it's when those are challenged that I think open-mindedness is the most important thing. Like if you think that you know something quite well and someone comes along with a radically different opinion, it's very easy to react emotionally and get defensive and go, well, they don't know what they're talking about. It's very difficult to be calm and measured and to take in that information, process it, take the bits that you want and move on. Yeah. So I guess that's one of the things about being humble is it's not just about the humility is one part of it, but it's also the ability to take in information from all sources, not discrediting them before you give them a chance and bring it in, take the bits that you need and move on. And um, that involves things like being a good listener and um, all that sort of stuff, a whole bunch of different, you know, complex skills, which are often made out to be easy. Like listening is not an easy thing to do. It's a very complicated thing to do. Uh, and so, yeah, hu humility is just so important because um, it's, gonna, it's going to enable you to continue to grow. Humility is really the, I think, the keystone to being a lifelong learner. Because if you know everything, you're not going to learn anything new. And if you're not open to things, you're certainly not going to learn anything new. And so I think humility is a very important practice simply because that's your path to growth. And um, no one likes eating humble pie but um, humble pie is the only pie that will never run out on earth. There's plenty for all of us. Yeah. And, you know, if we continue to eat it when we have to, as much as um, it's an unpleasant experience, it's actually, a, you know, in the long run, you are much better off by eating, you know, a lot of humble pie as you go and, and never um, getting too put off by the taste of it. <laughs> Alongside your alongside humbleness too, with and lifelong learning, which is a big piece for me too, because I believe lifelong learning is one of the key foundation pieces of a long successful career or long successful life. Actually, with, uh, is having curiosity alongside that that humbleness and being and being open, which you know means un understanding how you ask good questions and then and then coming in and listening. Right, so that's the uh, you know massively important. Just circling back to the first thing, um, and I can only remember it because I made a note of it. That's not my vast and amazing memory that's uh, that's got us here. <laughs> I told you listening was difficult. I forgot it halfway through. <laughs> was uh, motivation. So one of the big one of the pieces for you around when you're hiring someone is you know uh, is is motivation is super important to have people that are motivated coming into your organisation. And how do you go about determining or ascertaining that someone that is coming in? is truly motivated uh, and a good fit in your organization and your team and able to work with you? That's a good question. Um, I'll just touch on quickly why, what my view on it is um, and why it's important. As, as I know through my own life experience that um, everything has ultimately come down to me making a decision and me putting in the effort. Um, and so I have had to, there's a lot in my life, whether professionally, personally, whatever, that I've had to change. And um, you can put that into many different buckets, whether you want to, you know, put it in, you know, health and fitness or lifestyle or weight loss or um, behavior or the way you turn up to work. Everything requires change. And I'm a big believer that you have to have some sort of intrinsic motivation to actually want to get out of the bed and do that stuff. Um, um, I've had my fair share of experience with um, mental health issues and various other things and, you know, depression and anxiety and, the, um, you know, being able to get up and get going and get out of bed and get into the world and do things has to come from within, um, in my experience. There's no 
people, I think a lot of people wait to be motivated before they do things. And, you know, the, the world is not going to wait for you to get motivated. The world is going to carry on as it is. And so I think we often think of motivation as this sort of mystic fuel that's going to come along and suddenly we're motivated and we're going to be out doing all the things we love. And that, that's not my experience. My experience is that motivation comes and goes, but um, discipline is the thing that can remain consistent. So if you're with discipline and with structure, doing the same things, regardless of whether you feel like it or not, you're probably going to have a pretty good shot at achieving what you want to achieve. But circling back to the are people motivated thing, I think it's pretty obvious by people's energy and approach as to whether they're motivated or not. And often it's just that they will put effort into things, right? So they will put effort into the conversation with you. They will put effort into responding to things on time or doing whatever it is or um, I'm a big believer of, you know, try before you buy, try and engineer some sort of scenario where you get people to do a piece of work, um, whether it's paid or not, that gives you some feel for their competence, um, their approach, their mentality, their mindset, their communication, all of those types of things. So, again, reading people and understanding them um, I think is very difficult. Some people are relatively easy to read and some people are more transparent than others. Um, I've certainly found as the, the sort of more quote unquote senior you get in organizations, um, the more politics and the more people are not genuine and they have their own agendas and um, there's a whole other set of games going on. But um, again, it's one of those things where I don't have any sort of concrete Thing that I can say, except that it's probably a good thing to focus on is trying to understand, is this person motivated? Yeah. Um, and how you, how you do that is, um, you know, up to you. My way in general is just trying to see if not only their energy and how they engage with me, but are they like doing stuff in their life? Do they have hobbies? Do they have passions? Not necessarily anything doing the work. It's just, is this person living their life? Like, are they actually active? Do they have goals? Do they have aspirations? Are they interesting? Are they doing interesting stuff? Um, because you have to have motivation to do anything in life. It doesn't matter whether it's coming to work or not. Ideally, you'd be motivated to come to work and do whatever else you do. But. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. You know, that, that's great. And the, the trade before you buy is a really interesting one too. It's, it's something that may not be possible for all roles, depending on who you're hiring and when and what the situation is and how much time you've got. But that's an in incredibly powerful thing if you can do it because, A, it gives you a feel for – can they do the job? But perhaps more importantly, it's the meta stuff that sits around the outside of it is how they actually approach it. And what is it, you know, what's their approach and, and some of those other things that really give you some insight into what they are and who they are and how they operate as a person rather than just necessarily the piece of work. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's great. Well, that's, that's really cool, Matt. Um, if it's okay with you, I'd just like to um, just to touch on a, a role we had a conversation probably a year or so ago where uh, you, you talked through a role that you had, because this is particularly important for new leaders coming into, a, I think, if you're comfortable to have this conversation, um, coming into a role and, and the, the challenges that it can bring with it around stress and pressure. If you don't understand the, the way that leadership is different from, from the technical role that you've come from. Um, so this was a role where you'd come into an organisation. I believe it was early in the in, in the piece, and you were employee number two or three. And you, but you ended up taking on more and more of the responsibility in the organisation. It led to some real challenges. Would you like to just talk me through, talk us through what led to that and how that worked, and what was the outcome, and and how what you've learned from that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I joined an agency. I, I had my first business in Wellington was a digital agency, and I think there were seven of us. Um, at the time, and I met um, a gentleman who had an agency in Auckland who was, I think, 10, um, something like that at the time, and we got along really well. I, uh, my company was in Wellington, and um, his was in Auckland, and it was becoming fairly obvious that Auckland was the place to be to build a company like that, just much more work. So, um, And this was the company that I built with um, the gentleman who I mentioned much earlier, who, you know, 50-50 shareholder, um, lots of mistakes from both of us on that for sure. Um, but at the time I felt like well, I either needed to get him out or I needed to go. So 
um, decided to go and um, join, um, you know, this other guy to build this company. So um, when I joined, it was, you know, a small but pretty, you know, robust operation. And we built the company very, very quickly. So we grew to maybe about 25, 30 or so in the course of two years. Um, we placed 26 on the Deloitte Fast 50. Uh, we won lots of awards and, you know, had a, had a lot of success in that two years. It was like a, um, it was a very, very um, interesting experience to be a part of. Um, so I joined, the, the idea when I joined, there was actually two partners in the company at the time when I joined. And um, one of them, um, you know, was bought out not long after I got there. But the idea was that I would come in and be able to share in equity and all this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I joined and we were doing projects, probably the average budget of the projects we were doing at the time was maybe 10, 15 grand or something like that. And that very quickly became, you know, 25, 50, 100. So we grew the average revenue per customer very, very quickly. The size and scale of the projects we were doing grew very quickly. Um, we introduced a whole lot of new services around brand and things like that. So anyway, we had a we had a we had a good ride there for a while, right? But um, my experience of working there was um, uh, I was promoted to creative director at some point, which was really just a, a change in title. To be honest, my role didn't really change that much, but I was kind of fronting a lot of the business development for the company in terms of winning new business, doing a lot of the consulting, certainly doing the creative direction for the projects, solution design, you know, wearing all of the different hats that you wear. Um, I was essentially like the two I see of the company, basically. Um, the areas that I didn't touch um, were more related to finance and cash flow and accounting and all of that sort of back end um, business management stuff. I didn't really have anything to do with that. I was more the guy trying to put the numbers on the, on the balance sheet. Yeah. Um, and so um, at one point I was working very, 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 very long hours um, for extended periods of time. Um, I'd asked for, I'd sort of put my hand up a few times and just said, look, I don't know how well I expressed myself. Um, I was 24 when I joined and left when I was 26. So looking back now, I, I didn't actually realize how young I was to sort of, that is quite young to be in a position where you come in and you now suddenly, you know, I started as I think my title was head of client services or something. And so, um, you know, you're running project teams and then suddenly you're now hiring account directors and account managers and you're running those people who are running other people and you know so we we added a couple of management layers into the company as well at, during that time so it's not only just trying to output good work and, and grow the company is you're now bringing in management structures as soon as you hit about 20 people the whole dynamic of a company changes because now you have to have process and operations and all these things that you didn't have before that changes the nature of a company quite a lot. You know, the culture changes very much from going from a small close knit team to now suddenly having to have more of a corporate structure. There's all this stuff going on anyway. Um, the long and, and short of it of my story is I, I got severely sick and burnt out as a result of this. Um, uh, so, so, so Matt, you were, you were, you'd become a leader of a lot of people without any, support without any previous experience or training or guidance or anything and you were just trying to work it all out for yourself as you as you went through right that's the scenario yeah so i i um i had been managing people before without sort of really needing to manage i think when you're a small team when you're sort of five six seven you can kind of get away as operating as peers um particularly if people are capable um, then I suddenly found myself in a position where I was sort of managing people um, from a more day-to-day -day perspective. Then it was managing people who were managing people as well. And um, I had no idea about management whatsoever. I had no understanding at all. I, I remember at some point I got given the book 
high management, a uh, high output management, which is a very famous management book and an exceptional read. I never read it when I got given it, but uh, that was that was the management training I got. Was his high output management read it, and um, that's actually a good thing to do, um, but certainly not the, the level that I needed. Um, a lot of it was because everything was so fast moving. You, you're doing all this work. You're trying to get stuff out the door. You're winning new business. You're growing the revenue of the company while you're also trying to figure out how to manage people, how to how to manage yourself. The, the biggest lesson in that was to manage myself. You know, I let myself become so burnt out and overworked and sick. At one point, um, I thought I was going blind because I was starting to lose my sight. And, you know, I went to doctors and things like that and no one could tell me what was wrong. There, there was no, no indication of anything, right? Bloods were fine, but um, I was just so burnt out and stressed. Um, and then particularly in, in weekends and stuff like that to wind down, particularly in agency world, what does everyone do on a Friday, Saturday night? Like we go party, right? So. Um, you throw that in the mix and suddenly you become a very unwell person very, very quickly. And um, stress and burnout um, are very real things and they're very dangerous. And so the problem is, is as you get more stressed and burnt out, you become less capable of dealing with all of the stuff going on around you as well. So to not only are you getting worse, to everyone else you're getting worse because you're being more of an asshole. But the only, you know, it's, it's this sort of um, really horrible place to be in where I, I was at my wits end with everything. Like I, I knew that I was being snappy with people and, you know, not managing things the best. But I also felt like if I wasn't there and doing my job, everything would kind of fall apart. So I had this real, there's no good way to work through that. Right, and it eventually got to the point where you know people had to sit me down multiple times and go, "Look, you can't keep doing this. You can't keep speaking to people like this, treating people like this." Da da da. And I'm sitting there going, "Well, I'm just I'm just trying to do my best to keep you know keep this place going, to keep the lights on, and to keep doing what we do." And um, so, in hindsight, I think it was a lot, there was just a lot of um, immaturity, not only on my part, but from the perspective of the organization overall is um, you have to be able to invest in people and give them the time to develop the skills they need to do the job. And, uh, you know, we're often expected to develop the skills we need on the job, but I really don't think management is the type of thing to mess around with in that respect, because again, it has, People are one of your biggest assets and resource, uh, you know, your biggest assets, one of the most important resources the company can have, as much as I dislike calling people resources, but it's just for simplicity. Um, anything to detriment the people in your company is detrimental to the company, right? And one person can become very detrimental. And particularly when you don't get the support and things that you need, you often become a detractor and a defector when you were the biggest champion and advocate of everything the company was doing. And that transition happened very quickly. And um, that's certainly what happened to me. So um, I went, we went from, or from, from my lens, I went from being sort of like the, you know, the creative director, partner, the guy, you know, we can build the whole team around you to being like, you know, you, you need to, you need to go. <laughs> And that's a, that's a, there was a very quick turnaround and that's over a period of um, probably six months. And um, from my perspective, the whole time I was just head down, I'm doing my absolute best to show up and do what I need to do. And um, so in hindsight, now I can see many more perspectives on that whole situation than I could at the time, for sure. I was very angry, very bitter, very resentful. Um, I felt extremely hard done by. Um, and um, I didn't felt I didn't feel like I got a fair shot. Um, in hindsight, you know, some of that stuff I think is still valid, but I certainly see my part in it a lot more. I see, you know, how difficult it must have been to work with me and all of those types of things as well. And um, 
uh, very, very important lesson for me and, you know, series of lessons to get, to get by early. But I, the biggest thing I say to people now is I say, look, you've got a, this idea that time equals productivity needs to go. So my sister, for example, is obsessed with the amount of time that she's studying. And that's not really the appropriate equation. It's what is the quality of the time of your study? Because I think we have this idea that if we work longer hours, we get more done. And I, I, I really don't believe that's true, at least not for me. And I don't think a lot of the data suggests that either. Um, I'm, you know, there'll be studies on it and various other things. But um, I think you have to be able to set structure and say, I'm going to work. There's an optimal period of time to be working and you need to optimize that time. And if you have to work an extra couple of hours or a few hours or, you know, you have to a little nighter here and there, that's cool. But if you start getting beyond that period of reasonable time per day of working, like if you're working 60, 70, 80 hour weeks over a prolonged period of time, you're doing yourself a real disservice because your health and well-being is going to take a real hit and it can come very quickly and it can take a huge amount of time to actually recover from those things. I, I think it took me probably a good couple of years to recover from the level of burnout that I had. And that was not all to do with the company. A lot of it was to do with personal stuff that was going on, but you can't choose when you've got stuff going on at work and stuff going on in your life, right? Stuff just goes on. You have to show up to work anyway. So um, yeah, it was a, it was a very um, <laughs> interesting experience, but yeah, I think the thing to take from it is you, you've just got to know your limits and you have to stick to them. And um, you have to be uncompromising in your own health and well-being. You should not compromise your health and well-being for any company. And in fact, any company asking you to compromise your health and well-being for their interest um, is, is probably not being run that ethically or morally. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, there's some stats around the, the number of hours. I think it's around 55. Any, time, any, any amount of time over 55 hours a week you're working, you're, you're you're wasting, you're pretty much wasting your time. It's exponentially less valuable. Um, and you're better to go and take a break and come back and, and do things. Um, it, it also points really strongly to me that, you know, your ability to delegate, your ability to push decisions out to where they were, all of that stuff would have been a real challenge for you because a lot of what you would have been doing was just trying to get stuff done, right? Which is how you'd always, always got stuff done as opposed to thinking, well, you know, how, how might this work or having someone on your shoulder going, hey, you know, here's some things to think about. So, Matt, thank you. That's um, that's been <laughs> that's a tragic story, but incredibly powerful. And uh, and I, may, I imagine it's a sort of foundation, sort of pillar in your life and, and the way you you do things now and the way you run your organisation and and plan going forward. Matt, just before we wrap up, is there anything else that I haven't asked you that you that I should have, or is there anything else you'd like to kind of add in here that um, just to round things out? Yeah, I think touching on your last point about delegation and things like that. I think at the during that period of time, which I just described, I was able to delegate once. And what I mean by that is I was able to delegate and then if the work wasn't done or done to a sufficient standard, I would just take it over. That was my, my go-to. I, I didn't have the ability, nor the time to be fair, but I certainly didn't have the ability of leaving the responsibility with someone and supporting them in a way that would be conducive to them producing the outcome required. And there's a big difference, I think, between being able to delegate and being able to not take it back. Um, and now what I have learned, certainly the hard way, is not only do I need to delegate, not only is it necessary, not only are people better than potentially what I give them credit for and better than me at a lot of things, which to, you might be surprised, Campbell, I thought I was the best at everything for a long time. And then you know, suddenly I realized that actually <laughs> there's a lot of really capable people out there. But um, the, the ability to not take things back and have trust in people and have faith in people, I've always found that people surprise me. Yeah. When I let go and when I, and my, my approach is to say, I'm going to do everything I can to empower this person to get the outcome. And even if they botch it, I don't care. It's, it's about 
empowering them. And if, if this is a time where they have to make mistakes, so be it. But um, I'm going to give it to them and I'm going to stick with that decision. I think that's, that's been something that is very difficult for me to learn because I'm, I'm a capable person. And for so long, I was so used to just getting shit done, excuse my language. At some point you realize that getting shit done means focusing on the outcome, not actually doing the work. So to achieve the outcome, you have to engineer that that outcome is going to happen. So often it's, empowering, enabling, communicating, setting expectations. Um, it's other people doing the work to get the outcome. And that, that's sort of what being a manager is, is you're responsible for the outcomes, not the activities, right? So that's a very difficult transition to make when you're so used to doing the activities to get the outcome. Now, suddenly, your set of activities has changed drastically. And it's not the set of activities that you were doing before to achieve the outcome. The set of activities is largely around being really good at setting expectations with people, making sure they have the right information that they need, making sure they have appropriate KPIs and milestones and goals, making sure that they have appropriate structure and process around them, whatever it might be. But that's a very difficult transition to make. And um, particularly with people who are very capable and competent, the last thing that we want is being told what to do all the time or having micromanagers and things like that. And so, um, you know, if you're going to delegate something, delegate it and, you know, do your best to help that person achieve the outcome. Don't keep jumping in and taking it back. And that's certainly what I was guilty of when I first started delegating things. And it's not a pleasant experience for either person. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult thing. Um, and then I think probably the last thing that I will say is um, I'm a really big believer in find the people who have what you want and surround yourself with them. Do what they do. So if there's someone who has what you want, whether it be anything, whether it be a mentality, whether it be material, whether it be a job, whether it be um, an avocation, whatever, Find the people who have what you want and do what they do because you will inevitably end up getting what they have. And that's what I've tried to do my whole career is just surround myself or put myself um, around people who have what I want so I can learn what they do so that I can start doing that as well. And the, the biggest way that I have learned and accelerated my career is simply by partly riding on other people's coattails is by grabbing on and going, I'm going where you're going. Um, there is nothing you're going to do to shake me off. I'm coming. I'm helping however I can, but I'm on the journey. That's been part of it. And the other part of it is being going, okay, these people have what I want. How do I serve them? How do I add value to them? How do I get into their network, get into their company, whatever it might be? How do I get them to mentor me? How do I... How do I spend my time with those people? And the, the principle that I always talk to people about with this is, is if you want to learn basketball, I want to learn from Michael Jordan, not the guy at the end of the bench of the breakers. Right? If you're going to learn, go to the absolute top. Now, if Michael Jordan's not available, and for the basketball fans out there, this isn't me quoting my like top five players, but I'm just going to, you know, famous players that everyone knows. If Michael Jordan's not available, go to LeBron James. If LeBron James isn't available, go to Kobe Bryant and work your way down until you get the highest possible person playing at the highest level and surround yourself with that person. Um, and that's everything that I have learned in a substantial way has been from being around people um, who are at the sort of top of their field, you know, the, as high up as I could have found in terms of their level of capability experience. And then probably the other thing rounding it right out is that when you're around those people and you learn the things that you want to learn, everyone in New Zealand is willing to have a coffee with you, right? You can literally get anyone and be like, hey, I'm really interested in having a chat with you. Can we have a coffee? And most people will say yes most of the time doesn't matter whether you're a student or, you know, you're starting on your entrepreneurial journey or you're whoever. People always give you their time, usually, I've found. And so it's very easy to get those coffee chats going. Yeah. 
um, but coming right back to the start is even when you're around those people and you're learning from them, no matter how successful or experienced or how many degrees or how many millions or billions or no matter who you meet, the only thing that you can truly rely on is yourself. So coming back full circle, it's don't be afraid to have that confidence temper it with humility, but follow your own instincts, follow your own gut, follow your own heart, follow your own head. Um, because that's all that you can rely on. Just because someone has a huge amount of success does not mean that they know everything either. And so, um, you know, follow your own intuition, follow your own gut, um, stay humble and you can achieve anything that you want to really, um, you can, um, it's better when you set realistic expectations of yourself, for sure. <laughs> but you can, you know, you can pretty much do anything that you want to um, if you do it in a, in a disciplined and structured way. Matt, that is, uh, that's awesome. Aspirational, inspirational. There's gems all over the place in this interview. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And uh, this ain't going to be our last interview. I'm going to have you back at some point to uh, have another chat. So th thanks very much, Matt. It's been, been awesome having you on the show. Thanks, Campbell. Appreciate it. Okay. See ya. See ya. Thanks for listening. If you have a friend or a colleague who would benefit from this episode, please pass the word along. If you have a friend or a colleague who would not benefit, but you haven't been in touch with them for a while, give them a call. iTunes reviews are great to get the word out and to help me create the show that's most useful for you. And if you're frustrated or having challenges or would like some help, guidance, assistance with your first leadership role, then check out integrationcatalyst.com in the link in the podcast notes below. Or pass this on to your boss to nudge them to get you the help you really need to cross the doing to managing chasm and get you powered up on your leadership and management journey. Oh, and if you want to make sure you don't miss an episode, hit subscribe. Until next time.